Well, hey everyone, really good to be here. Thank you for the kind introduction, Paul. As he mentioned, I'm one of the pastors at River of Grace Church, along with several other elders there, and it has been a gift to be there for the past two and a half years now. And uh, I was not always uh, in Concord, New Hampshire. Actually, before that, I'm gonna kind of give you a little bit of a 30,000 foot view of my life. Before that, I was, um, I was a discipleship pastor at a church in the metro west suburbs of Boston in a town called Medway, a uh, tiny town, with a decently sized church that I was blessed to be a part of for eight years and served there. And well, before that, I, uh, I was from, I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, black and gold, milk and honey, um, championships, all the things. And Mr. Rogers, and who doesn't love Mr. Rogers? And anyway, my wife and I and son, I think we got a picture here. Uh, we moved to Concord two and a half years ago. I don't and need, I don't maybe the picture to both yet. What's that? I don't need a picture yet. Oh, I'm not making it in there. That's all right. Um, you can Facebook me or something. <laughs> and just not now. And anyway, so we moved there two and a half years ago, and it has been a blessing. And before I jump into the sermon this morning, I just wanted to say how blessed I am to be a part of the Village Green Collective. So one of the things that pastors, they don't get, they, you might not have heard this before, but pastoral ministry can be kind of lonely sometimes. You don't have a lot of people that do what you do. And I did not have a ton. I had some support in my last position, great, great internal staff and so on. But I didn't have a broad network of brothers who I could just lean on and Paul and Ethan and the Village Green Collective have been those people for me. Ethan has modeled faithfulness to, to God's call on his life, a willingness to, to go wherever God calls him, and he is uh, just a heart for the mission of God. And, and Paul, Paul is just a, a brother to me, and I've learned so much from him. He's someone I can, I can go to and, and ask for advice or feedback and he's always eager to get it, and he is wise. And his love for the people here and the people in the community is something I just admire so much. But today, to jump into the sermon now, we're going to look at Psalm 125. Psalm 125. They're in a section of Psalms called the Songs of Ascent. If you have a Bible, go ahead, or a cell phone, or whatever it is you're using to look at Scripture, go ahead and open it. And they're, they're called the Psalms of Ascent. These are pilgrim songs. These are songs that people would have sung at least three times a year as they would make their way to Jerusalem. And if you're unfamiliar with the biblical story, Jerusalem was the place where the people of God met with God in deep and profound ways. So these are people journeying toward God, singing these songs, over and over and over again as they make their way to God. And I think that as we look in our text this morning, what we're going to see is this song, this song has a way to inform our own journeys towards God. Because we're journeying in a direction either toward God or away from Him. But if you're journeying towards God or leaning towards God, I think this song has something to say. And as we step into it, I want us to begin thinking about safety. Safety. We are a culture obsessed with safety. We have car seats in cars. So first thing about cars, when you buy a car, like one of the things they boast about is the is the the safety rating of the car. And you know, we got we got you know, front airbags and side curtain airbags and crash tests where they put a dummy in a car and drive it at 90 miles per hour into a pool and see how it fares. And we, we rate that because apparently a lot of us are driving 90 miles per hour into pools. But we have obsessed about safety. Babies. There's lots of little ones here. I have a five-year-old. I remember when, when we found out we were having a kid, we looked at every little safety thing. Maybe I'm just weird and compulsive, but we, you know, we want this car seat that has the highest safety reviews, this five point safety harness. We got covers for our doorknobs, locks for our stove and oven, right? All the things that keep us safe. 
I was just on a plane and one of my favorite things about flying is the little safety information card that they ask you to consult. And I'm like, there's no way I'm looking at that thing, <laughs> right? Because it's gonna tell me to do some ridiculous position. And the only thing I'm gonna do if we're going down is cry and hope my body is recognizable when it's all over. <laughs> we look for people who are emotionally safe. We want safe people. And listen, none of this is bad. It's fine to be about safety. We live in a world that's dangerous. But as we step into Psalm 125, I want us to let it reframe how we really view safety and stability. And what I want us to see, simple point that we can teach our kids, that we need to remind our own hearts of, and that's sometimes so hard to believe, is that true security, true safety is found by trusting God. That ultimate security and ultimate safety is found in trusting God. So I'm going to read one, Psalm 125, and we have a little habit at River of Grace I'm going to ask you to participate in. When I get done reading the word, I will say, this is the word of the Lord, and you'll say, thanks be to God, because God has spoken. And no matter how the rest of the sermon goes this morning, God has spoken in his word, and he wants to speak to us this morning. So hear what God says in Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. It can't be shaken. It remains forever. The mountains surround Jerusalem, and the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forever. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, so that the righteous will not apply their hands to injustice. Do what is good, Lord, to the good. To those whose hearts are upright, but as for those who turn aside to crooked ways, the Lord will banish them with the evildoers. Peace be with Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Would you drive your heart? your word into our hearts this morning, and would you let us be convinced anew of the ultimate security that is found in you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So today, like I said, I want us to look at what it means to live safe and sound, a secure and stable life in a world that is not safe. And the first thing that you're gonna to need to do is to declare what is true. Declare what is true. Look at right at the beginning of our passage, if you have it, your Bible open. Right at the start, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. It cannot be shaken. It remains forever. Mount Zion, or Jerusalem, was a mountain that was fixed on, and it was a city that was fixed on a mountain. It was thought of as the ultimate place of stability, the place that God met with his people, the place that was fixed, that couldn't be moved, that couldn't be changed, that couldn't be altered. Jerusalem, Mount Zion, was that place. And why? Well, first, it had the high ground. In a time where there were war, there was war, Jerusalem was sitting on top of a hill. And it had a fixed position as high ground so that when enemies attacked it, they had the advantage point of being able to see down and claim the high ground and potentially defend themselves from their enemy. But the second reason why Jerusalem was seen as a fixed, permanent place, why this city mattered so much, was because it significantly signified the promise that God made with his people, that he would be their God and they would be their people. And that that promise was sure. So when they looked at Jerusalem, they said this signifies a promise that God's made. And it is a stable place. And because of that promise, and because of who God is, it was seen as a place of ultimate stability. Look at what Psalm 46 would say about Jerusalem. It would say this, there is a river its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of God Most High. God is within her. She will not 
be toppled. God will help her when morning dawns. God is within her. She will not be toppled. Safe, sound, and secure. And what the writer is saying, friends, is that what's true about Jerusalem is also true about you. God is within you. You won't be toppled. You need to declare what is true about you. And what's true about you is that you're safe and sound because God is in you. And he is with you. But the second thing we need to do after we declare what's true about ourselves, we need to declare what's true about God. Look at, he keeps taking the mountain imagery even further. Look at verse 2. The mountains surround Jerusalem, and the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Jerusalem is secure. And he says you're secure because God surrounds you like the mountains surround Jerusalem. What's more secure than a city on a hill? A city on a hill surrounded by other mountains. That means enemies would have to literally get over those mountains to get to your mountain. And the psalmist is saying, you know what? God is the mountain, like the mountains around Jerusalem. Like you step outside here and you see the hills kind of all surrounding us. It's saying God is like that. He is surrounding you and he is strong. Nothing can get to you without first passing through those mountains. But here's the thing. Sometimes we don't feel this in our life with God. We don't feel like God's around us. Sometimes we even feel like God's against us. Or sometimes we think that God is, a, is just kind of out to get us. And if you maybe come from certain church backgrounds or, or maybe you just are just keenly aware of your own shortcomings, you can feel like you're walking a tightrope with God. That, that you just have to keep obeying in just the right ways for God to be happy with you. That, you gotta, that those mountains aren't there to protect you. You sometimes think those mountains are going to fall on you if you don't live the right way. But that's not the picture in the Bible at all. God surrounds you, Christian, follower of Jesus. You are safe no matter what. You are secure in Jesus. Your safety doesn't depend on your degrees of faithfulness. Your safety doesn't depend on your perfect obedience. Your safety depends on the perfect obedience of somebody who already perfectly obeyed, who died and who rose again, and who's seated in the heavens, and who's ruling and reigning over all things. You're not walking a tightrope with God. You are safe and sound and surrounded by a God who loves you. You've got to mind yourself what's true, what, what's true about you and what's true about God. You are stable. You are like Jerusalem, and you are surrounded by a God who loves you. But the problem is, as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't always feel this way. We don't feel surrounded by that God. And then, what do we need to do? Like, after, if we don't feel surrounded by God, what do we need to do next? Well, we need to remember how the story ends. The world is not a safe place. We do need five-point safety harnesses, and we do want seatbelts on our airplanes, and we, we, the world isn't safe. It's perilous. It's dangerous. And we can feel completely surrounded by everything other than God sometimes. And sometimes we can feel surrounded by our sicknesses. The pain of our circumstances can surround us. Maybe you've been had a recent diagnosis. Maybe you have autoimmune conditions. Maybe you're faced with the daily struggle of trying to get your kids insulin just right. Feel surrounded. Maybe you feel surrounded by debt collectors or the credit card company that keeps mailing you reminders that your payment is late. 
or keeps reminding you that your APR is 25.5% and the credit card bill just keeps getting deeper and deeper. Maybe it's loneliness. You're surrounded by people, but you feel like you are just engulfed in despair and loneliness. That though you know a lot of other people, those other people don't know you. Maybe it's the loneliness of singleness as friends are married or the loneliness of a marriage that is where you, you and your spouse are just at odds with each other constantly. Maybe it's having literal enemies, people who seem to just have it out for you. Whatever you're surrounded by, they make life hellish. But this is where I want us to see that the Bible in general, and this psalm in particular, is not written on the bliss of an easy life. It's easy to read this psalm and say, that's great, whoever wrote this, maybe David, we don't know, but that's great, but my life doesn't feel that way. Well, well these people, when they wrote this psalm and when they sang this psalm, they're under exile. They're in exile under another kingdom. What they're experiencing is not great. They don't know what's going to happen. And, and yet, look at verse 3. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous so that the righteous will not apply their hands to injustice. Their circumstances were not awesome. They didn't know exactly what was going to happen. They were in exile, and yet they declared the truth to their heart. They declared, the scepter of the wicked will not remain forever. It won't. They reminded themselves how the story would end. They reminded themselves what was true about them, that, hey, that God surrounds me, that that I am stable and secure, that nothing happens, that God is able to hold me through it all, that he is with me, and they remind themselves how the story ends. And this, they would say on their way to Jerusalem in the middle of exile, after watching thousands of their people potentially killed in war, say, scepter of the wicked, the rule of the wicked will not remain forever. It won't. They're surrounded by their enemies, but they're reminding themselves, no, no, no. We may be surrounded by my enemies. I may be surrounded by my enemies, but I'm surrounded by God. And whatever I'm going through will not get the final word. And if you place your trust in Jesus, this is true for you. This is your story. That no matter what's going on around you, you are safe and sound. It may not feel that way, but you have a God who is holding you and surrounds you in wickedness and suffering and sorrow will not get the final word. But if you're not following Jesus, this is not true for you. If you're not following Jesus, you are not safe and sound. You are dependent solely on your own ability to control circumstances and outcomes. And friends, that leads to nowhere. I like to hike. I, I live in New Hampshire. I live about an hour from the, 45 minutes to an hour to from the bottom of White Mountain National Park, National Forest. And so I go up there quite frequently. I was just up there two weeks ago going up in a little bit. And I like to hike 4,000 footers. And one of my favorite things is getting above the tree line. Man, when the sun's out, above the tree line's amazing. Get great views. If it's fall, it's beautiful and wonderful. But above the tree line, if you're a hiker, can also be terrifying. You're exposed, completely exposed to the elements. Like whatever comes in, whatever storm systems come in, you've got nowhere to hide. You just hope you've got a good rain jacket and that you're on your way down and to safety. It's not a good place. You read on like blogs and stuff, hikers who get up into the whites and the weather takes a turn. And then all of a the sudden, they find themselves in a cloud, unable to see beyond three feet in front of them and cliffs on a side. That's terrifying. Well, friends, if you've not placed your faith in Jesus, you're living 
above the tree line without any shelter. Life may be good, and it may feel great while the sun's out. But I got news. We live in a broken world, and the sun doesn't stay out. Weather will come. And where are you going to run? Where are you going to go? Are you going to trust your control of outcomes? Or are you going to turn towards a Savior who says, Come to me, all who weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And realize that you can have shelter in the storm by the God who surrounds us and who loves us and who offers ultimate security that remind you what's true about you and remind you that the story will not end with wickedness getting the last word. You want to live with security and stability in the middle of chaos. Got to remind yourself what's true. Got to declare it to your heart. You need to reflect on how the story ends. Middle of it all, we we live with doubts in the meantime. But we're invited to keep coming back to these two practices. Remind yourself what's true. Remind yourself how the story ends. To work through the psalm this morning, I'm going to break like at two different points and I give you some questions. I know you have some notes section in your bulletin, uh, your handout. Here's some questions. You can take a picture of the screen if you want or write the questions down and think of, think on them. What, what do you feel surrounded by? you got to name it sometimes. Like sometimes we feel surrounded, but we never actually put our finger on what it is. Maybe it's just anxiety. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's whatever it is. What do we feel surrounded by? Maybe you can share this around the table with your family or your small groups or whatever. And then what are the lies you tell yourself in times of trouble? Because the thing I know from just being a human and being a simple human being is when I'm surrounded, I tell myself all sorts of lies. God's forgotten me. I'm alone. I'm unsafe. I don't, I don't know where to turn. And then, how do the, what truth do you need to remind yourself of? And if there's anything, uh, something else I want us to see from the psalm is that these people said this three times a year. It takes practice. Yeah. Like, you've got to keep doing it. You've got to keep doing it over and over and over again. Because life will just keep coming at us. And we've got to keep doing this over and over again. So, we declare what's true, we, we remind ourselves how the story ends, and then we invite God to show up. How do we live safe and sound? We invite God to show up. Verse 4, do what is good, Lord, to the good, to those whose hearts are upright. In the middle of the chaos, in the middle of being surrounded by wickedness, the psalmist cries out to God. This is a repeated pattern in the Psalms. We don't have enough time today to walk through each time. Scripture invites us to call out to God in the middle of the mess, but it does. The encouragement from Holy Scripture is to invite God to show up in the mess and invite him to act. These people are journeying, they're pilgrims like we are. We're journeying towards God on the way to him and they're surrounded by their enemies. They're reminding themselves what's true. They're reminding themselves that this won't last forever. And they're saying, they're calling out to God, do good, Lord, to the good. Show up, invade the space, change the circumstances. Would you use that power to change my current predicament? Would you use your power to fulfill your purposes? That's what he's doing. And we are invited here to do the same to invite God to show up. Often we don't. When we're in the middle of our difficulties, we sometimes forget God, let him exist on the fringes. We sometimes don't even know what to ask for. But maybe what we can ask for is, God, would you just show up? And would you begin changing this moment? God, this, I know this is this doesn't feel right. I, would, you, would you show up here? And I think we can be confident that he will. Invite him in. Invite him to show up. Frederick Buechner writes this, kind of lengthy, but I think it's up there. For what we know, of course, is not just that God exists. For what we need to know, is, of course, is not just that God exists. Not just that beyond the steely brightness of the stars, there is a cosmic intelligence of some kind that keeps the whole show going. That there is a God 
right here in the thick of our day-to-day -day lives, who may not be writing messages about himself and the stars, but in one way or another is trying to get messages through our blindness as we move around here knee-deep in the fragrant muck and misery and marvel of the world. It is not objective proof of God's existence that we want, but the experience of God's presence. This is the miracle that we are really after, and that is also, I think, the miracle that we really get. In Christ, you get this miracle, that God is offering you his presence in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your life, whatever you're going through, major or minor, God is offering his presence in the fragrant muck in my <coughs> of your life. He's offering himself to us. He's offering himself to you. Will you let him come? Will you invite him in? Will you let him change you? If you want to live safe and sound, you need to invite God in. And you need to put yourself in places to experience God showing up on Sunday mornings to hear the word preached, even when you don't feel like it, even when your heart feels withered and hard. You need to show up to the people in your life who can hold you in your brokenness. You need, will be taking communion here later. You need to take communion knowing that Christ wants to meet you and remind you that he has secured you through his sacrifice. He wants to meet us, but so often we don't invite him in. But we need to, and Christ welcomes us too. So, how do we live safe and sound? We declare what's true. We remind ourselves how the story ends. We invite God to show up, and then finally, we do what is good. After we've done everything else, do what is good. Look at the, uh, I think it's verse 5. 4. Do what is good, Lord. Sorry. Uh, but as for those who turn aside to crooked ways, the Lord will banish them with the evildoers. We're invited to do good in the middle of the mess. The writer points this out because some, when things were hard, when life was difficult, they, they probably defected. They turned away from the Lord their God, the God who delivered them out of Egypt, out of slavery. Some turned aside. And there is a danger in our own struggles that when we're faced with difficulty to defect, to, to forget God, to turn from him. We might feel that pull. I've felt that pull. And we're like, why the heck is this happening? We can be tempted to leave God. But the psalm here reminds us, no, 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 in the middle of all this, when you're tempted to give up, when other people are giving up, remember, remember that those who turn aside their crooked ways, the Lord will banish. Remember, like it's, you're not going to find life there. And what would it mean to do that? It would mean to live in ways contrary to God. To look to things for salvation, for salvation other than God. To look for hope in other places. Don't turn aside to crooked ways. Don't, don't defect. Don't turn back. It's super tempting. It's, it can be really hard to turn back to the bottom when life is hard. To, to run back to that gambling addiction. To, to maybe just forget God altogether. But don't do it. Don't do it. It's, it leads nowhere. I promise you, keep doing good. Keep walking in the ways of God. Psalmist would remind us of the first psalm. For the Lord watches over the ways of the righteous, but the ways of the wicked leads to destruction. We do good. Pursue good. Declaring the truth to our hearts. Remembering what will happen. Inviting God to show up in the mess of life. Why do we do that? Why? Well, because Jesus himself modeled this for us and paved the way for us. He is the way of truth and life. He, he took on the worst suffering any human has ever, ever felt. He felt separation from his father. He took 
the sins of mankind upon him. He defeated Satan, sin, and death. He guaranteed the outcome of life would not be one where suffering and wickedness and evil and brokenness gets the last word. He guaranteed a life that exists forever with him. He gives us the spirit to help us now. And we live this way because Christ has died for us. He has secured us. And he's given us the spirit to empower us now. The passage ends, after all this stuff, the passage ends kind of abruptly. It's kind of a strange ending if you were to just read it. After saying, the Lord will banish them with the evildoers, he says, peace be with Israel. It's kind of odd. And I think... Eugene Peterson explains this section well. He says, And so the last sentence is, Peace over Israel. A colloquial, but in the context, accurate translation would be, Relax. We are secure. God is running the show. Neither our feelings of depression, nor the facts of suffering, nor the possibilities of defection are evidence that God has abandoned us. There is nothing more certain than that he will accomplish his salvation in our lives and, his perf and perfect his will in our histories. Three times in his great sermon, Jesus, knowing how easily we imagine the worst, repeats the reassuring command, do not be anxious. Our life with God is a sure thing. It is a sure thing. You can live safe and sound because Jesus has gotten the reins of the universe and he's ruling over it. Several years back, I lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and I was going to seminary there. And Nicole had a friend visit. And what, is, what do you expect to do when you visit friends in seminary? Well, you visit the distillery. And we visited uh, Maker's Mark, which is a picture of Maker's Mark is this is if you've never been it's on the kentucky bourbon trail and it's old and even if you don't like maker's mark it's amazing it's got these barns with red shutters and there's a limestone like riverbed with a little creek running through it right and it was uh the oaks day which is the set friday before derby so it's kentucky's day at the track it's like a party everywhere they got food trucks and self-guided tours which is my favorite kind of tour and they got people stationed at each spot around the distillery where we got to go and ask questions and do tastings. And so we're wandering around in this perfect um, May, Kentucky day. And we wander into the, I, we did our tastings, wander to the barrel aging room and just barn, just filled with barrels upon barrels of bourbon. It wasn't heaven, but it was close. And, and, uh, I'm standing there looking at all these barrels and there's a there's an old timer sitting outside, works for Maker's Mark, wearing a little name badge, black shirt, cowboy hat, like made out of straw though, not like one of the Texas ones. And he's got shades on so I can't see his eyes at all. And he's got a big, big white kind of scraggly beard. And I'm asking him a bunch of questions, being the inquisitive type about the barrel rooms and he's explaining all of the different barrel rooms that Maker's Mark has all around Bardstown, Kentucky. And we're kind of sitting there enjoying the view. There's like kids playing, you can hear the band, you can hear the birds, it's perfect. And he's just standing there leaning against the railing on this deck that we're standing on. He's stroking his beard and it's silent for a second. And I'm just standing there wondering how I'm gonna just walk away from the conversation without it being awkward. And he interrupts and goes, so, this world ever goes to hell, Kentucky gonna be all right. And I said, okay, why is that? He goes, well, we got more barrels of bourbon than we have people. <laughs> and I started to laugh, but he didn't at all. He was 100% serious. And, you know, I was thinking that it's a terrible thing to trust him. But you're gonna trust him someday. And there's no better person, there's no better one to trust than God himself who holds you. He's better than bourbon. He's better than whatever we run to. You know, I, I'm a fan of church history and 
there's a catechism. And if you're not familiar with church catechisms, we're just simple question and answers that people use to help remind ourselves of truth. And sometimes they were used with children who couldn't read, so they could remind themselves of truth. But there's one from the Lutheran tradition called the Heidelberg Catechism. And question one is simply, what is your only comfort in life and in death? In the catechism, if you were in catechism class, you would answer it this way. Is your only comfort in life and death that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ? He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. What's your only comfort in life and in death? And I, you are not your own, but you belong body and soul. You're a good shepherd. You're a faithful shepherd, Jesus Christ. You're safe and sound. So rest in me. That's one final re reflection as we, before we close. How should the certainty of God's protection shape whatever it is you're facing right now? Let's pray together. Father, it is so easy to doubt your love and protection of us. It is so easy to become anxious when the world seems spinning out of control. It is so easy to forget that you surround us. Jesus, would you remind us that true security isn't found in managing outcomes, and found in circumstantial change, true and lasting security is found in trusting you. Would you help us to remember that? Would you help us to live from that secure place that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height nor depth, nor any other thing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank y'all. Thanks, Don. All right. Um, we do this every week, and we celebrate communion as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so uh, Rose will be in the back. She's holding a plate with broken matzah and a cup with juice. Broken matzah represents the body of Christ. The cup of juice represents the blood of Christ. One of the things that Don was, as Don was preaching, I was thinking about is just like this idea that we struggle with sometimes is that injustices seem to get the final word so often. A weekly reminder by going to the communion table is a reminder that Jesus gets the final word. He has and he will get the final word. And the cross is the climax of God's justice for humanity. And so if you believe that, if you believe Jesus is the Lord, the Savior of your life, we invite you to come back, celebrate and remind yourself of that. Jesus has given the final word. It is finished. He has died once for all sinners. So come celebrate with Rose. Celebrate as brothers and sisters in Christ. If you have never done that, if you've never taken the step of accepting, acknowledging Jesus as your Lord and Savior, talk to me. Talk to Gabe. Where's Gabe? Uh, well, after Gabe's done playing drums, talk to Gabe. Talk to Ethan. Talk to Don. Talk to a family member, friend you're here with. Do that. It can be the best decision you ever made. Let's keep worshiping.